Good morning and welcome home. I'm glad you have joined us for worship today. My name is Rodera Paris Woods and I am the Director of Journeys in Faith, Children, Youth and Family Ministry here at University Park. This video is being shown both on our YouTube channel and our Facebook page from 10 to 11 this morning. We are responding to comments live on both platforms. The video will remain up for you to watch later if you like. If you are with us today for the very first time, welcome. Until we get to return home to our sanctuary for worship, you can find us here on our YouTube channel or you can find us on our Facebook page. For 125 years, University Park United Methodist Church has worked to be the hands and the feet and heart of Christ for our neighborhood and the world beyond. We are committed to creating and strengthening authentic community and to supporting one another, not only through this pandemic, but in all of life. If you'd like to check in on our comment string, please say hi. We would love to hear from you. And if you are new to worship at University Park, please feel free to use the comment section this morning to ask questions about the church, and someone from the staff will get to you. Also, please click on the subscribe button as well as the like, because the more subscri subscriptions we get, the easier we are to find online. So we would greatly appreciate your help with us spreading the word. Whoever you are, wherever you are, on this great morning, whatever you believe or question or even doubt, we are delighted to have you with us in worship today. When this pandemic is under better control and our community is back home and our church building, we love to have you join us in worship. So welcome to worship. We are glad that you have joined us. We wanna take this time to thank Pat Fletcher, our liturgist this morning, as he offer us our call to worship. The saints speak of something they call the inextinguishable light. It is a light not of the eye, but of the heart that never ceases to walk in purity and clearness. It swiftly leaves the darkness behind and constantly strives towards the day's height. Its constant quality is to be continually purified. This is the light of eternity that can never go out that shines through the veil of time and matter. The saints never say that this light is given to them, but that it is given only to those who have purified their hearts in love for God on the narrow way they have chosen.
Bethany Hader Krabs and I am your director of wholeness and healing and I would like to invite you to participate in our building beloved community moment this morning our question today is what are you working on improving uh, whether that's within yourself in your house in your community one of the things that I am working on improving is how I handle conflict uh, I am a type 9 on the Enneagram and one of the things that we struggle with is we are great at peacemaking for other people, but we're not always great about speaking up for ourselves or um, handling conflict straight on. We tend to kind of step back and make ourselves okay with the conflict instead of actually dealing with the conflict. So that's one thing that I have been working on for years and I'm sure I'll be working on for years more, but I would love to hear what are you working on improving? You can answer this question with people in your household or you can Type your answer in our live stream chat so that others can engage with you. I hope you'll participate. Today's scripture reading is from the book of James, chapter 1, verses 17 to 27. Every generous gift of giving and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave us birth by the word of truth, so that we would become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness, and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. Be doers of the word, not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if there are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in the mirror, for they look at themselves and on going away, immediately forget what they saw. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. If any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues, but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this, to care for the orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Your only 
Son, no sin to hide, but you have sent him from your side to walk upon this guilty sod and to become the Lamb of God. Your gift of love they crucified, they laughed and scorned him as he died. The humble king they named a fraud, and sacrificed the Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. O wash me in his precious blood. My Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. I was so lost, I should have died. But you have brought me to your side to be led by your staff and rod and to be called a Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. O wash me in his precious blood. My Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, oh, wash me in his precious blood. My Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Good morning. My name is Radera Paris Woods, and I am the director of Journeys of Faith, traditionally known as Christian Education, here at University Park United Methodist Church. Here at U Park, we have named our children change agents as we believe in creating and cultivating the leaders of today for a better tomorrow. Calling all change agents, report to headquarters for your next mission. Good morning, change agents. How are y'all doing this morning? Awesome. I pray that everyone is safe and doing well. So our lesson today comes from James chapter 1, which we heard read so beautifully in our hearing a little while ago. In order to discuss this particular chapter, I thought we could play a game called What If? Now, here's how it goes. I'll tell you about an imaginary event, and I want you amongst yourself at home to discuss it and talk about how you would feel if you were ever in these positions. Now remember, I'm only making this up. It's not real, but it can be. So imagine this. You're playing on the school playground, and you scrape your knee. You hobble over to your teacher, who's watching all the children on the playground, and you start crying. And as you're crying, you're saying, teacher, teacher, I scraped my knee. So here comes the what if part. What if your teacher looks at your bleeding knee and says, oh my, I am sure God will heal your knee. Let's pray. How would that make you feel? Or here's another imaginary event. 
you walk to your friend's house one day and the sun is shining, the birds are chirping, the sky is clear, it's a beautiful day. You have a great time playing with your friend, but now the time has come for you to walk back home. The same walk home where the sky was clear, this beautiful day is now pouring down raining. You don't have a raincoat, you don't have an umbrella, and your friend is standing next to you at the door looking at the rain coming down. Now, what if your friend says to you, I had a great time playing today, all right, hope you get home safely, and then walk back into their home. How would that make you feel? Or how about this one? You're in school and it's almost lunchtime. You look into your school bag and you see that your parents forgot to pack your lunch. You don't have anything to eat. So you tell your friend. Now, what if the same friend that you told that you didn't have anything to eat walked with you to the lunchroom, sat down next to you, opened up their lunch bag, and said to you, I bet you'll be glad when you get home, and then continue to eat their lunch with a smile. How would that make you feel? Let us revisit our what if stories. In each story, it seemed like you could use a little bit of help, don't you think? I would say so. Like when you scraped your knee on the playground, instead of your teacher offering prayer, it would have been great for your teacher to offer to clean up your sore, put some ointment on it, put a Band-Aid on it, and maybe even giving you something if you were in pain. Or how about when you went to your friend's house and you had to walk back home and it started pouring down raining and you didn't have a raincoat or umbrella and your friend just said, hope you get home safely. It would have been great if your friend could have offered their raincoat, their umbrella, or some type of shelter or covering from the rain so that you can make it home dry. Or even in our last scenario, when you didn't have any lunch, it would have been great if your friend could have gave you half of their sandwich or some of their chips or half a cup of their juice, something so that you would not be hungry the rest of the day. Now, our Bible story tells us that Christians must do things. Those of us that love and believe in God, that we must put our love and faith into action. That is not just good enough to give somebody a well wish or to hope things get better, but to actually put that into action. Now, we've heard this song sang quite often in our congregation, but it says, they know we are Christians by our love. We have to show our love by doing things. And we call this ministry, service, or simply just love and action. It's important for us to get together as a family of believers and sing and pray and read the Bible because these things make us grow stronger in our faith and give us confidence. However, we should not stop there, but we should take all those things and put it into action. If someone is in need, we should be able to provide that need. Everything we believe means nothing if we don't put our belief into work. So this week, I want each of you to find a way to do something special for someone who is in need. Now, I'll let you figure out what that might be. And when we come back together again next week, in the comment section, I want you to share with all of us the things that you have been able to do this week to make someone feel special or to fulfill a need that someone may have. Now, before we pray out, I have one question for you. What if no one ever told you that God loves you? How would that make you feel? Now, I want you to think about that as you go throughout this week searching people who you can do something special for and fulfill a need. Okay? 
Let us pray. God, we thank you for your people. We thank you for these, your change agents. And we thank you for your word that encourages us to take our faith and our love for you and put it into action and to the world. Help us as we go through this day, as we go through this week, to find people to do something special for and to fulfill a need. We pray all these things in your son's precious name. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Until next time. Hi there, U Park family. I'm away on vacation this week, but I did want to take just a moment to thank the Reverend Kathy Coble for preaching this morning. In my short time here, Kathy has become an invaluable partner in ministry, and I am grateful for her leadership. Kathy's a retired United Methodist pastor from the Texas Annual Conference, and she brings a wealth of experience and wisdom to her involvement here at U Park. She leads our justice and activism team. She recruits and schedules liturgists for worship. She serves on our nominating and leadership development committee here at the church. Her steady presence and her wise perspective have helped me tremendously as I began my work here, and I am delighted that she's offering us her thoughts on this morning's scripture text. So the next time you see Kathy, please offer her your thanks, not only for preaching this morning, but for all of our service to University Park United Methodist Church. In 1899, James Weldon Johnson wrote a poem entitled, Lift Every Voice and Sing, 
which his brother John set to music that same year. The following year, on February 12, 1900, in the Johnson's hometown of Jacksonville, Florida, a choir of 500 children from Stanton School in Jacksonville sang the song as part of a celebration of Abraham Lincoln's birthday. At the time the song was first sung, James Weldon Johnson was principal of Stanton School, which was a segregated school. The song his children sang that day became a time an anthem for freedom and civil rights. These were his school children singing his song, which rang loudly and boldly with a strong sense of struggle, perseverance, and hope. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, thou who has brought us thus far on the way, thou who has by thy might led us into the light, keep us forever in the path we pray. In 1916, James Weldon Johnson went on to become field secretary for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People and dramatically increased NAACP membership and the number of branches in the U.S. In 1917, he organized the famous Silent March down Fifth Avenue in New York City to protest racial violence and lynching the march, which numbered approximately 10,000 participants, was the largest protest organized by African Americans up to that point. Johnson's participation in the campaign against lynching continued for the next two decades. Johnson went on to do many notable things in his long life, but the words of his song continued to inspire a nation in the midst of the continued struggle for justice. But back to those children, those 500 Stanton School students who 110 years ago sang a new song about struggle, perseverance, and hope. The song and its sense of hope has lived on and is sung in churches and schools across the country even to this day. It gives us a sense of the inextinguishable light of God's hope the inextinguishable call for justice and equity. Let's listen to that song now. <laughs> voices, and even though we could not see their faces just now, merely hearing them lets us know that they are beautiful children, and that inextinguishable light which takes life in the voices of these children gives me hope, for it tells me that the struggle for justice, human rights, and equity as it continues today is ignited by the same inextinguishable light. The author of the letter of James, who wrote the text that Pat read this morning, tells us that every generous act of giving, every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. This is James's way of saying that God is the giver because God is the creator. In the beginning, God brought light into being and put light in the heaven and upon the earth and within all creation on the earth. James is telling us that the light coming from God is inextinguishable, imperishable, indestructible, unquenchable. The light has no beginning and has no end. This light lives within us as one of the gifts of our faith. But of course, James doesn't leave it there. James tells us that the gift of life is illumined by the practice of our faith. Be doers of the word, James writes. Doers, not merely hearers. While we don't know much about the writer of the letter of James, we know that he is all about faith and works 
and how relationships within a community embody God's intention for us to love one another. Loving one another's neighbor, James says, fulfills God's ultimate law. James's letter stands out as a mandate for care of others. He invites us to humbly engraft ourselves to the one who has the power to save our souls. The letter of James points us to justice, human rights, and equity. Where does the church stand on these principles in the past? Where does the church currently stand on these principles? Where have we as individuals stood in the past on these issues? And where do we as individuals currently stand on these issues? For many years in our nation's history, people of color in our community have been striving towards justice, human rights, and equity. Voices have been raised. People have marched, demonstrated, boycotted, advocated, and been jailed. Blood has been shed and lives have been sacrificed. Way too many lives have been sacrificed in the name of justice, human rights, and equity. And yet, the struggle for true justice and equity in our country continues. We know our history. It's not pretty. Our nation has never provided the groundwork for justice or human rights or equity, and people of color have suffered mightily in our nation in unspeakable ways. Through the entire length of our history, People of color have striven against a deeply entrenched, complexly interwoven system of injustice, which has placed privilege in the hands of whites and excluded opportunity and equity for people of color. Those two systems, the system of privilege for whites and the system of injustice for people of color, are like two powerful rivers, two mighty rivers with deep and strong currents. And for many years in our nation's history, these two rivers ran alongside each other, only occasionally spilling over their banks onto the other. But these two great rivers are now at a mighty confluence, churning and pounding into each other in a fierce, roiling collision. The confluence of these rivers signals the beginning of a new era in our nation. And we have witnessed that collision in response to the killings of George Floyd in Minneapolis, Ahmoud Arbery in Georgia, Breonna Taylor in Louisville over the past few months. And just this week, Rayshard Brooks in Atlanta. And folks have taken to the streets in anger and frustration, determined to make their voices heard that the system must change. And for me, the good news about these protests is that there are so many people voicing their demands. They are young, yes, very young. But I can attest to the fact that there are older people there as well as allies, carrying signs and marching and singing in solidarity with their younger co-advocates. Of course, there are people of color there, but there's a very, very wide, diverse, representation of people who want justice for all. People of color, indigenous people, the Latinx community, joined by the LGBTQ and transgender communities, even white coats for black lives and other organized groups who advocate for change. And many whites have joined the ranks as well a great confluence of voices and ideals, demands and aspirations, energy and passion. It is the very inextinguishable light shining very brightly into the darkness that has overshadowed our nation for far too long. It is the battle for the soul of our nation, a battle which has been fought for 200 years, beginning with the abolitionists and carried on by the Underground Railroad in the early days of the NAACP. Through the courage and vision of people like Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, Ella Baker, W.E.B. Du Bois, James Weldon Johnson, to name a few, and yes, the 500 children who sang his anthem on February 12th. 1900. 
and then boldly carried on by leaders in the years after World War II, Rosa Parks, Medgar Evers, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, James Baldwin, Maya Angelou, John Lewis, <clears throat> Frederick Vincent Harding, Angela Davis, to name a few. Strong, invincible voices for justice. And now we have a whole new generation of courageous voices whose inextinguishable light shines on. Writers such as Ibram Kendi and Brian Stevenson, William Barber of the Poor People's Campaign, Black, Life, Black Lives Matters founders Patrice Conquilur, Alicia Garza, and Opal Tometi, who carry out the fight for freedom, liberation, and justice, again, to name but a few. And here in Denver, activist Tay Anderson, Black Lives Matter Denver, Hassan Latif, founder of Second Chance Center in Aurora, again, to name but a few. So how do we participate in the battle for the soul of our nation? First and foremost, by acknowledging that it is our fight as well. We are in this with all oppressed people because as Dr. King proclaimed so eloquently, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Or stated a bit differently, one person's struggle for justice is everyone's struggle for justice. One people's struggle for justice is all people's struggle for justice. It's really about truth and reconciliation, confronting and acknowledging the past and working together for a just future. So we listen, and we listen very carefully to the voices of our brothers and sisters who are in this fight for justice, human rights, and equity. We take the time to find out who they are, what they are saying, what they are doing, and we make every attempt we can to join them in solidarity. We read them, we watch them, we work with them, we support their organizations, we become part of their lives and part of their struggle, and we work with them to change the system. We actively work for equity in distribution of wealth and resources, in education, in employment, in policing and the legal system, in housing opportunity, especially for those experiencing gentrification and homelessness, for health care, in access to technology, in the effects of climate change, and so much more. As we become allies, we step out and step in and live into this moment because this is not about other people's souls or other people's well-being or their survival. The injustices they are fighting against are about us as well. The injustices are ours to pay attention to and fight against. The work can be daunting and overwhelming, but we start where we can and we work in ways that we can and we do not stop until the changes come. And then those two rivers will begin to flow as one. And we will know peace. God has given us the perfect gift from above. The gift of faith, which is illumined when we speak out for the oppressed and when we take action to end the oppression they suffer. It's been too long, this national struggle. It's unfinished business, and it's time for us to help finish it. Amen. Would you pray with me? God of hope, God of peace, God of inextinguishable light, we pray for our brothers and sisters who continue to struggle for equity. We pray for true justice and the strength to fight for it. And we ask that you would grant us a vision of your world as your love would have it, a world where the weak are protected and none go hungry or poor, a world where peace is built with justice and justice is guided by love. You have given us the perfect gift of your light. Help us to shine the light within us to others as a beacon of hope. 
Thank you for those who are bravely standing in solidarity for equity in this land. And we pray for their future, a future of well-being and security, a future with hope. And now hear us, God, as we lift our voices in the prayer you have taught us. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day your daily, our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Here at University Park, although the doors of our church are closed, the work of the Lord is still going forth. We continue to be the arms, legs, and heart of God to our community and beyond. We continue to partner with our community agencies to provide food, clothing, and other basic needs for the survival of our community. We are extremely grateful for your continued prayers and financial contributions that enable us to support our community in all the ways we can. To help us continue supporting our community, you may send your gifts to University Park United Methodist Church, or you can give on our website at uparkumc.org under the Give tab. So thank you in advance for your life-changing gifts. We have just a few quick announcements for you. Our new hymnals have arrived. We recently purchased the Worship and Song Supplemental Hymnal for use in the Sanctuary and Wasser Chapel. Some of the music from our past few weeks and years is from these hymnals. These green hymnals can be purchased for $12 and dedicated to a loved one. You can purchase them on the giving page on our website or by sending a check to the church with instructions for your dedication. This Tuesday, we will be offering the Labyrinth to Walk at the Evanston Center for Spiritual Wholeness and Healing. We will be open from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. Our labyrinth is modeled after the famous labyrinth at Chartres Cathedral in France. We ask that you wear masks and, uh, to wear while inside, and we will also provide you with shoe coverings. Our pastor, Rev. Andy Dunning, is on vacation for the rest of June. We ask that if you have any pastoral needs, please contact myself or Kevin flaubert Rollins in the church office. Next week, our sermon will be provided by our very own Radera Paris Woods. And on July 5th, we will welcome Reverend Stephanie Price from The Land to offer our sermon. We will be offering a special four-week session of Grief Share on grief and COVID-19 
It will start this Thursday at 6.30 p.m. over Zoom. If you would like to participate, please email me or call the Evanston Center at 303-722-7217. Please note that if you recently lost a loved one and are not yet ready to participate, you can join our full 13-week grief share cycle that will be offered in September. Thank you so much. words of benediction. May you have true kinship with the inextinguishable light within you. May you take joy in letting it shine through your energy, passion, and commitment to live into the kingdom of God's hope for the world. In the name of God the creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen.